Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today for another in the series of webinars presented as part of the Gray Learning webinar series and a special thanks to Tamron for sponsoring today's presentation. I'm actually very excited about this presentation. Well, I suppose I'm very excited anytime I get a chance to present because I just find it to be great fun. But this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and I've, I've found it's very interesting over the my goodness, a very long time that I've been a photographer, decades that I've been a photographer and decades that I've been teaching photography in some form or another, there's oftentimes this sort of swing back and forth in terms of emphasis when Photoshop was you know, sort of first around or first being a serious contender for photographers and when digital cameras first started coming out, I would find photographers were flocking to everything digital. And then after a while, I realized they had forgotten completely, it seemed like, about composition. They were taking pictures that were not necessarily very good and then just trying to bludgeon them into good condition in Photoshop. And I saw that shift to a little more of a focus on composition, which I was very happy about. But I've also noticed that it seems to me that a lot of photographers are not understanding the very basics of optimizing photos, some of the more basic adjustments. And honestly, those are among what I consider the most important, the absolutely most important adjustments. Basic tone and color in some respects can be the most critical adjustments. And very often I find that the adjustments I'm going to show you today are by and large the only adjustments I need for my favorite photos. And so I'm finding increasingly if I do a good job in the camera, I need very few adjustments to get to the point where I'm happy with the image. So the focus today is to help you really understand some of the more, the more basic adjustments, you might say. Now, of course, I need to use a piece of software in order to demonstrate these adjustments and talk about the concepts involved. I happen to use Lightroom to manage my overall workflow and to optimize to perform most of the optimization work for my images. And so that's what I'm going to use today. But I want to emphasize very strongly that the key concepts here will apply with virtually any software that you're using to process your images. Now, keep in mind, in particular, I know many of you are users of Adobe products in some form or another. Perhaps you're using Photoshop, for example. Maybe you're also using Lightroom. And in either case, if you're shooting in RAW, then you have processing capabilities in Lightroom via the Develop module and in Photoshop via Adobe Camera RAW when you process your RAW captures. And both of those are essentially exactly the same. The engine behind the develop mod module in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw is the exact same engine. You'll have the same adjustments available. You can produce the same results. And of course, if you're using other software, that's perfectly great as well. There are a variety of good tools out there for processing your raw captures and other photos. And so you'll just need to sort of translate the concepts that I'm presenting to these specific adjustments. But you'll find that most of the adjustments I'll be talking about are available in just about any other software you might be using for processing your images. So first off, let's talk about a very fundamental topic that perhaps many of you consider just to be already understood. You knew this years ago, decades ago, and that is to shoot raw to capture in your camera's RAW format, or if your camera supports it, the Adobe DNG or digital negative format is essentially the same thing in terms of being that RAW information off your image sensor. Obviously there's differences between some proprietary RAW formats and the Adobe DNG format, but I group those together by virtue of providing the best potential quality for your images. And what do I really mean by that? Well, fundamentally, there's one key issue that relates to RAW versus JPEG in my mind, and that is JPEG artifacts. JPEG files always have some degree of compression, so there's always some degree of quality loss. Even at the highest quality setting, there is some loss there, and there's the potential to see a little bit of a grid pattern based on the way the compression algorithm works with the JPEG image. It's dividing the image up into little blocks of 16 by 16 pixels, and sometimes there will be evidence of those blocks based on the way the compression is applied. And so that is the first and foremost reason to use raw capture is to make sure that you're not going to get those JPEG artifacts. But also it gives us some insurance. Now, of course, most of us never need that insurance, right? We're going to get the color absolutely perfect and the exposure absolutely perfect right in the initial capture. So we don't need those additional benefits of raw. Isn't that right? 
I like to tell myself that every now and then as well. And yet, sometimes I find a situation where I run into trouble. Now, I should hasten to point out that this image has a bad exposure through no fault of my own. That's the most important thing I want you to take away from this presentation today. This was the second shot in the sequence, and then this was the third shot in the sequence, and interestingly, the camera at the time was set to aperture priority mode. And so, for whatever reason, the camera just did not adjust fast enough to the sun being more or less in the frame, or very close to being in the frame. Here you see, for example, a 15 hundredth of a second shutter speed. That was nowhere near a good exposure here, obviously, and I don't know why the camera made this error, but I promise you it was the camera and not me. And I also promise you that I did not consider this an artistic photo. I'm a fan of all things aviation. I saw this airplane flying by. I had no idea what it was, and so I wanted to capture a couple of images so that I could figure out what kind of plane it was later. <clears throat> but getting back to that original, here is the image that I came away with from that first frame, and it is nearly completely blown out. There's very little information there. And yet, if we go down and adjust that exposure back just a little bit, we start to see an increasing amount of information. I can also use the clipping preview that we'll talk about a little bit later to adjust that black point downward. Maybe I don't need quite that much. And I can fine tune the white point if I'd like, and maybe darken down the shadows just a little bit. I could even pull back the highlights, something like that. Granted, this is not a photo that I'm ever going to hang on the wall or print or really share in any context other than an educational context. But that said, it is quite impressive, I would say, how much information I'm able to extract from that raw capture. Well, the problem is that when you see someone demonstrate something like this, they show you the benefit of the raw, but they don't show you what would have happened with the JPEG capture. But I'm going to show you exactly that. And you might be shocked at how good the JPEG actually turns out, kind of, sort of. So I'm going to select, here is a JPEG rendering with absolutely no adjustments. So this would be an out of the camera JPEG, essentially. But I'm going to go back to my raw capture and select both of those images so that I can then synchronize the adjustments between the two. I'm going to apply the exact same adjustments to my JPEG image that I applied to my raw capture. And you can see from the thumbnails down here toward the bottom left that the images look to be roughly the same until we take a look at the actual JPEG. And notice the posterization, one of our key words for today, a little vocabulary lesson. Posterization, that loss of smooth gradations of tone or color, and that is because the JPEG image is an 8-bit per channel image. The raw capture is something else. It could be 12-bit, it could be 14-bit, it could be 16-bit, depending on your specific camera. That will get processed generally into a 16-bit package, if you will, but the original capture depends on the analog-to-digital conversion in your camera. I would say that most cameras today are 14-bit per channel in terms of that conversion. There are some that are 16-bit. I'm sure some still are down at that 12-bit number. But in any event, that is one of the key differences here, is that we don't have the quality of information because we don't have the quantity of information. So there is yet another argument in favor of RAW, as if we needed any more reasons to shoot RAW. It's just a good practice, I would say. It gives you a little insurance that you'll hopefully never need. Also, it is helpful, I'm sure many of you, all of you have heard of the notion of expose to the right. And what that means essentially is that we want to expose our images so that the exposure is as bright as possible without clipping highlight detail. And the reason we call it expose to the right is because if you've done it properly, the histogram display will be shifted over toward the right not to the point of getting clipped, where that mountain range, as it were, gets cut off over on the right side, but as far to the right as you can without sacrificing any detail in the highlights. Why is that so important? Well, with exposed to the right, we are maximizing the amount of information that we're recording. The way to think about this, without getting into all of the mathematics behind it, is that we are capturing light. The information we're recording is light. And so if we want more information, we want more light. Less information in the context of a digital image equals noise. So I captured a sequence of images here. 
and you can see that I've gotten brighter and brighter and brighter. And as a result, each time the histogram updates, you'll see that it gets shifted further and further over toward the right. But let's take a look at an interesting thing. What I did is captured some images with a relatively high ISO setting so that we could really exaggerate the effect here. So we'll take a look first at the sequence of higher ISO. So these are at 16,000 ISO, so we would expect these to be noisy. And a sequence of exposures here, again, getting brighter and brighter in one-stop increments. And so this would be borderline, just on the verge of blowing out the highlights, and so that's what we would define as exposed to the right. Well, what happens then if we sort of equalize those exposures? If we take the exposure that was one stop under and bring it up by one stop, and this, the exposure that was two stops under, at least based on exposed to the right, bring it up by two stops, etc. Well, I have exactly that that I can show you here, my virtual copies. So bear in mind that there's going to be some variation in color here mostly owing to the noise. In fact, let's go ahead and we'll click into the center of the image and oh my goodness, look at that noise. Now keep in mind that the only thing that changed about each of these individual exposures that I'm showing you is the shutter speed. Also note, I have turned off noise reduction because I want to see the real results. And as we go brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, we see the noise levels disappearing, even though we're at the exact same ISO setting, the exact same overall setup for the camera on a tripod with the same exposure settings. The only thing changing is the shutter speed. This is an illustration of that exposed to the right concept. And why do I mention these two issues first, exposed to the right and shooting raw? Well, it's because when I want to process my image, I want to start with the best possible results. I want to start with the best initial point so I can get to the best final point. And if you take a look here, this image started off very, very dark, as you saw just a moment ago. If we go back to all of the images here, this is the dark version. This is a very dark exposure. I have probably, arguably, not clipped the shadows, maybe just a tiny little bit, not too bad. But my highlights are essentially middle gray, and I want those shifted over. So let that be a visual lesson, hopefully, in the value of exposed to the right, especially if you need to raise the ISO, especially if you're going to want to reveal as much shadow detail as possible. And speaking of exposure, let's get started with some of the actual adjustments. And so again, bear in mind that your specific adjustments may vary a little bit depending on which software you're using to process your images. And so I'm going to start off taking a look at the exposure slider, which is one of the sliders I use the least among these basic adjustments in Lightroom or in Adobe Camera Raw. Exposure I use the least. Why? Because I try to get the exposure absolutely perfect in every shot, he said, with an effort at maintaining a straight face. I do try. I don't always succeed. And so my basic rule for the exposure slider is that I use exposure when visually the image doesn't look to be an optimal exposure. If I've exposed to the right properly, that often means I need to back off on the exposure just a little bit. In this case, for whatever reason, probably somebody distracted me, so I set my camera wrong, <laughs> or I just made a mistake, and my exposure was off, so I want to increase the exposure. I can look at the histogram, I can hold the Alt or Option key on the keyboard to see when I start to get clipping for the highlights, but based on the way the exposure slider works, I actually don't recommend that. Instead, I recommend simply evaluating the overall image. I trust that you are using a calibrated display, so you've adjusted the brightness, for example, and just fine-tune your exposure based on a visual evaluation of the photo. We're going to fine-tune things a little bit more afterward. This is just trying to get you to a good baseline. So here, for example, I've increased the exposure by three-quarters of a stop just to get the image to where it aesthetically feels like I'm in good shape. Then the real fun begins. And this, I think, is perhaps some of the more important considerations as it relates to overall exposure settings when we're fine-tuning our tonality for our images. I want to make sure that I'm setting an appropriate black and white point for the image. And so that calls for setting the whites and the blacks. 
If you have been using Photoshop for a while, you're very familiar, of course, with the levels adjustment, being able to set a black point and a white point independently. The corollary to that might be the contrast slider, which I'll talk about in a little while, but the contrast slider doesn't give you as much control over independently setting the whites and the blacks. So I've already conceptually adjusted my exposure to where the overall scene just looks to be properly exposed, or hopefully, as is the case here, I somehow magically managed to get a good exposure right out of the camera. That's probably thanks to the metering mechanism in the camera. But now I want to take a look at the whites and the blacks. And there, I'm going to definitely take advantage of the clipping preview. We do have a clipping preview display up at the top of the histogram here, but my preference is to use the Alt or Option key on the keyboard. And nowadays, most software that enables you to adjust the black point or the white point enables this feature where you can hold the Alt or Option key while you're dragging the adjustment slider to see a clipping preview. And so the idea here is that I would hold the Alt or Option key and drag that white slider over toward the right until I start to see pixels appearing. Then I would back off to the left until they disappear. But as you'll notice, when I'm even at a neutral value of zero, I have a little bit of clipping. So maybe my exposure wasn't quite as perfect as I thought. I might want to back that off until I get no clipping, but you can see in this case, that's impossible. I fully blew out that detail, those small details that you can see. Well, let's consider why that would be the case. If we look at the area that was blown out here, that would be a Ferris wheel lit up very brightly at night. And so, of course, I'm not surprised at all that we blew out some highlight detail there. And frankly, I'm not at all concerned about it. And so when I'm adjusting the white point, in theory, I don't want any clipping. But if I have bright lights, specular highlights, glare shine off of some shiny object, then I'm not going to worry about it quite as much. And then the black point, very similar in concept. Generally speaking, again, I would hold the Alt or Option key back off to the left until I start to see pixels appearing and then move back over toward the right until usually either the last of those pixels has disappeared or I've got just a handful of pixels in small areas. Conceptually, I want to have at least one area of true black or very nearly black in every photo. Not necessarily always, as we'll find out soon, but generally speaking, I want at least some degree of black and white in the photo, covering all of those zones, so to speak. And so you'll need to take that into account as well. And of course, recognizing that we can come back and fine tune things later based on other adjustments. But using that clipping preview gives me a great starting point, establishing full tonal range, full contrast in the image. But again, bearing in mind that you may have some sort of exceptions to that concept of not wanting to clip highlights or shadows based on, as we saw here, some of those very bright lights, for example. Taking a look at another image, this would be the counterpoint, you might say, in that we don't always want to just go by that mathematical approach. What I don't want you to do is become a robot, to just go through the same workflow, always applying the same essential approach to your adjustments. So let's take that approach here. I'll hold the Alt or Option key and set my white point until I start to see a little clipping, then I'll back off right to about there. And then I'll do the same thing for my black point until I start to see a little bit of Oh wow, I can't even get any clipping. Oh my goodness, let's see what the image looks like. Well, not so good. So I've stretched out that histogram trying to maximize the tonal range of the image, except there was no tonal range in this image. It was a foggy day, it was very dreary, everything is gathered right around that sort of middle gray. And so in this case, I might not even touch the blacks and the whites. I might just boost my exposure just a little touch just to kind of brighten up that fog in theory, maybe I want to pull down a little bit on those shadows just to emphasize the space needle shrouded in fog there, but I don't always need to stretch out that histogram. And so while I like taking that approach of using the clipping preview, it's also important to keep in mind all of the many exceptions that are going to occur in your photography. And then some of the most fun, I would say, in terms of these adjustments, and that would be the shadows and highlights adjustments. So once I've established my white and black points, so again, holding the Alt or Option key, dragging to the right until I see detail being lost for the whites and then backing off till just about the point where I've no longer got any of that clipping. Same thing for the blacks, generally speaking, salvaging some of that detail if it was clipped a little bit in the initial conversion. 
Also bearing in mind, in theory, I might want a silhouette, so there are all sorts of decisions you might make, but it's a pretty good rule that if we maximize the, the width of the histogram, if you will, if we stretch out that histogram to get a true white and a true black, or very, very nearly so, that usually gives you a good starting point. Not always. We can think of all sorts of examples, as we just saw, but that is usually a good starting point in terms of tonality. Now we can start thinking, in theory, about contrast, the slider we've ignored. And really, this is about contrast, as I'll talk about in a moment. But more importantly to me, it's about detail. And I think too many photographers get caught up thinking about how much contrast, how much saturation. Instead, let's think about the quality that we're imparting to the image, the impression that we're giving the viewer. And in the context of tonality, so much of that relates to detail. How much detail do I want you to see versus holding back? Holding back detail means more contrast. Revealing detail means less contrast, but we can think of it in the context of the photo. And so, for example, here, I can mathematically prove to you that I have not lost any detail in this image. There is no clipped detail. The highlights are not clipped. The shadows are not clipped. I have got everything here. And yet, if you look at the bright highlight detail, the bright feathers up at the shoulder here of the bird, as it were, it doesn't look like I have much detail there. And so if someone, if I had this image up in a gallery trying to sell it and someone said, yeah, but you don't have very much detail in those bright feathers, I could argue with them all night long about how there absolutely mathematically is detail, or I could accept that detail being there mathematically isn't the same as visual detail. And so the highlights slider provides a solution for that. And I love the highlights and shadow sliders. They give me the ability to adjust the tonality of the highlights and the shadows independently. But more importantly, they allow me to choose how much detail to reveal or to emphasize. I might want to brighten up those highlights. In this case, probably not. You can see now I actually am getting clipping. More commonly, once I've established that white point, assuming that I've sort of maximized the value for the whites in the image right up to the edge, then I would never want to brighten the highlights because that's likely going to lead to some clipping Instead, I would pull back on those highlights. And as I do that, notice in that sort of shoulder area, the white feathers there, I'm revealing considerable detail that was not previously visible. And so then it's just a matter of choosing the extent to which I want to emphasize that detail versus sort of exaggerate the fact that this bird has these white feathers. And then the same basic concept applies with the shadows. Here, once again, I might not take the shadows downward because I'm likely going to start getting a little bit of clipping at some point, at least visually, even if not mathematically. So I might normally be inclined to open up that shadow, so to essentially add a fill flash type of effect, you might say. But the question then becomes, how much detail do I want to reveal? Well, this is sort of a psychological question, you might say. If you're a nature photographer, there's a good chance that your initial reaction is, I want more detail. If you're maybe, let's call it a fine art photographer, then you might say, well, no, I want to enhance this contrast and really kind of bring out the strength of the contrast, the, the different feather values, the darks and the lights. I want to emphasize that, so I want to darken the shadows. The reality is there's no one right answer. We can create a really interesting photo where we've got strong, strong contrast because I'm revealing less feather detail, or we can make an image that shows you kind of the interesting textures and details of this bird by opening up that shadow detail. The key is recognizing, number one, that we have this ability to choose how much detail to present, and also to keep in mind that it is all about detail. How much detail do I want to present versus not present in those highlights versus those shadows? For me personally, I tend on the side of liking to have a little bit more kind of drama in the photo, a little bit more contrast, and so I'm going to tend toward slightly darkening my shadows in many cases, and then the highlights, usually darkening them ever so slightly, sometimes more so, again, all about the focus on detail. How much detail do I want to present to the viewer? And then that brings us to contrast, which we don't even need to talk about because we just talked about contrast. We just didn't really call it contrast per se. And what I mean by that is that 
I adjusted the overall perceived contrast of the image by adjusting the degree to which I'm brightening or darkening the highlights and brightening or darkening the shadows. The more detail I'm revealing, the less contrast there is. The less detail I'm revealing, the more contrast there is. And so sometimes your goal might be contrast. Other times it's more about detail. I certainly encourage you to focus a little bit on the importance of the detail or the lack of importance when you want to sort of hide that detail. But in some cases, you may actually prefer to use the contrast slider. And I would never argue against its use. I would just say, perhaps first, take a look at highlights and shadows. But sometimes you start fiddling with an image and you're adjusting and you react saying, that's good, but I just need a little bump in contrast. Or the contrast is a little bit strong. And in those cases, certainly, you can increase the value for contrast or you can reduce the value for contrast. And if you pay attention to the histogram, what that's really doing is spreading out the detail, shifting toward the black point and the white point, essentially taking the middle tones and spreading them out toward the extremes in order to increase contrast, or pulling all of that detail closer to middle gray to tone down the contrast, to reduce contrast. And so I would say in general that if you're going to use the contrast slider, you probably want to use a relatively modest setting. So adjust your highlights and shadows, and then if you feel, uh, I like that, but it's just a little too strong, it feels a little harsh, then reduce the contrast slider just a little bit. And if you say, well, that's good, but it's lacking impact somehow, then maybe increase the contrast just a little bit. In this case, being this sort of weathered scene, I'd probably tone down that contrast just a little bit. But again, I would emphasize that there's not a single right answer when it comes to how you interpret your photos emphasis on your photos, you're the photographer, you get to choose that interpretation, but do keep in mind some of these details along the way. And then clarity. In many cases, I find that part of the reason that I captured a photo in the first place was texture. In this case, this is a perfect example really to me in that I saw this door and I was immediately struck by all of the textures. In fact, that's part of the reason that I converted the photo from color to black and white, because I wanted to emphasize the texture. I'll talk more about black and white a little bit later. But the problem is that then the texture in this case just doesn't quite have that impact. I've darkened down the shadows, as you can see. I brought the highlights down just to avoid having these areas appear to lose a little bit of detail. But there's still a lack of impact. Now, in theory, I would go with contrast there except contrast is acting more broadly across the entire image. So with contrast, I'm going to darken the shadow up at the top and brighten the area down at the bottom, for example. That can certainly work, but that doesn't bring out much in the way of the fine detail. So contrast, I generally think of as applying very broadly to the image. And then sharpening is focusing almost at the pixel level, in some cases, literally at the individual pixel level to help draw out more detail, more sharpness. Clarity is somewhere in between. It's like sharpening across a slightly larger area of the image, and it can be absolutely incredible at pulling out detail. And fortunately, because of the way clarity works, there is very little risk of getting halos. When we sharpen, we often will see a glow around the, the stronger edges, the higher contrast edges within our images, the telltale sign of over sharpening. With clarity, we don't really have to worry about that, or at least not too much. What we do have to worry about is what I refer to as this crunchy appearance in the image. It's starting to look a little too urban, a little too harsh. Some people may like that, and there's nothing wrong with that if it's your thing. But I would say generally, I don't want to go too strong with clarity. I just want to accentuate the details and the textures in the photo. In other words, I captured this image because of those textures. I certainly don't want to lose those textures as part of my processing of the image. And so I might want to emphasize those a little bit. And taking a look at a couple of other examples here as it relates to clarity, we'll see that in a situation like this, for example, very soft light. I wish I could have stayed for a few more days and waited for a sunny day, but it was overcast. And so I have relatively soft detail. There's a slight haziness. Now keep in mind that Lightroom and Camera Raw have a dehaze slider that can help really reduce the appearance of haze in a photo. Clarity operates in much the same way, just to a lesser extent and in a more localized way, meaning, meaning focused on smaller details. And so if I go to my clarity slider here, 
Now, as I start boosting that value, we really start to see more and more texture and detail throughout the image. And notice nothing in the way of halos like we might see with an overdone sharpening effect. So certainly I would suggest that a little self-control can be very helpful, can be a good thing when it comes to optimizing your photos, but also bearing in mind that with some of these adjustments, they're intelligent enough, the algorithms are sophisticated enough that we can push them fairly far without having any significant problems. And you can see here that that really helps to accentuate some of those details that were lost on account of that soft lighting. And in other cases, you'll find, and this is especially true with a raw capture, and it's one of the sort of biggest challenges I feel with raw capture, and in large part, it's a mindset. If you captured a JPEG, then you would have a scene, a photo that looks, in many cases, closer to what you saw with your eye, with more contrast and more saturation, etc. With a raw capture, things by their nature are going to be a little bit flatter. And so there is some post-processing required to get the photo back to what you saw, to what you experienced. And then, of course, as photographers, we're artists after all, we want to push things a little bit further to try to make the image look even better. And so taking that into account in this case, this guy, as you can probably appreciate with all of the color going on and the moody clouds, this was a very dramatic scene. And yet it lacks a bit of that impact. And if you start to think about, well, I need more contrast, I need more oomph, that's where clarity can help significantly, I would say, in many cases. Again, think of it as sharpening that's happening across a larger area. And so by increasing that value for clarity, we can really accentuate the contrast, the detail, the texture. It really can have a tremendous impact on a photo. Now, for many of us, myself included, the tendency with clarity, with very few exceptions, is to increase the value, sometimes to increase a lot, hopefully not too much, but do keep in mind that we can also set a negative value for clarity, which gives us this sort of ethereal, almost painterly type of effect. It's a little bit reminiscent of a double exposure where you set the second exposure out of focus to get that kind of ethereal glow. And this can work very nicely for portraits in many cases, as well as for more, I think of it as more delicate subjects, flowers and, you know, kind of pastoral scenes, that type of thing. So clarity can be used in both a positive and a negative. I generally do favor a positive value, but obviously, of course, we can use a negative value as well. Oh, excellent question. Going back to the raw, I was talking about raw capture. So just to take a couple of questions from the audience here. What's the difference between compressed and uncompressed raw formats? Obviously, part of that is owing to the fact that one is compressed and one is uncompressed. Generally speaking, but you'll need to check your specific camera here, the idea is that we can take that information and describe it in a more efficient manner. So that when there's a lot of duplication, for example, we can describe those duplicated areas in a more efficient way. So it's file compression that is, in most cases, but not all, lossless. And so you're not sacrificing anything, but you might, it might take a little bit longer to process the image to generate that compression, but the file size will be smaller. However, in some cases, when you use a compressed raw format, there might be a little bit of loss, and in some cases, a lower bit depth is used in order to create that smaller file size. So do be sure to take a look at the specifics in your camera. Oh, great question from Rachel. What about a file format when using an iPhone? There, with few exceptions, you are going to be using JPEG, but note that there are some apps now that, for example, enable you to capture in Adobe DNG using your iPhone. The benefit in the case of an iPhone is not going to be huge, but there is a benefit to be sure. Oh, and then Philip was just asking about the shutter speed changes for exposed to the right, and I was separating my exposures by one stop, so doubling or halving the exposure time depending on which direction we're moving. Uh, and then Jerry, great question, Jerry. The contra of, as it relates to contrast, doesn't curves do a better job than the contrast slider? Yes, it does. Curves, I would say, is very, very similar in concept to the highlights and shadows sliders. So, in fact, let's go ahead. I'll go back to my images for shadows and highlights here real quick. And we can take a look at this image. I'll reset my highlights and my shadows values there. And then come back down to the tone curve. And you'll see that I'm currently on a linear option for my point curve, meaning no adjustment at all. 
I can go into the parametric option and notice that I have highlights and shadows. So I can darken down the highlights, maybe adjust those shadows a little bit, or I could work directly with a point curve. So I could pull down the shadow area and push up the highlight area or vice versa. Maybe take the highlights down just a tiny little bit and the shadows down a little bit more. If I'm pushing the highlights upward, then that is certainly going to give me more contrast. So pulling down the shadows and up the highlights. So I would say that yes, the tone curve can relate and in many cases is used for purposes of contrast. I would argue that in most situations you can use the shadows and highlights for the basic control there. And then if you feel that you need the tone, the sorry, the contrast slider, you might want to go to the tone curve instead or the curves adjustment in Photoshop because it will give you a little bit more control over the overall image. All right, so let's talk a little bit about color in the context of our basic adjustments. And I wanna start with this other image of the Duomo in Florence to emphasize a point here. And so we have a capture here that's had some minor adjustments applied to it. Notice though that the white balance is set to as shot. So this is the color balance that came right out of the camera, which presumably means that this is what the camera thought was accurate color. And one of the questions I get on a regular basis about color and trying to ensure accurate color in your captures is whether or not you should insert a gray card or a color checker. You saw my photos of the color checker passport, for example. And I would say that those techniques should only be used for situations where you actually need accurate color in terms of neutral lighting, meaning as if the scene were illuminated with a perfectly white light. This scene was not illuminated with a perfectly white light. If it had been, I would have been very disappointed because I got up at sunrise for the express purpose of trying to photograph the Duomo under early morning light, a nice golden hue to the color of that light. And so if I were to try to neutralize that color to compensate for that golden color of the light, suddenly we have a quote unquote much more accurate color view of the image. And I would say if that is what I got by waking up for sunrise, I would be very disappointed indeed. And so keep in mind that in many cases, we're not trying to compensate for the color of the light per se, we're trying to get the color to be as accurate and pleasing as we possibly can. Accurate meaning what did it really truly look like and pleasing meaning I know what it really looked like, but I'm gonna make it look even better. And that's up to you and your artistic decisions for your photos. But in many cases, we're just compensating for the overall color cast of the scene, for the overall lighting of the scene. Here, for example, in a subway station here in New York City, we have some lovely kind of yellowish, little bit kind of purplish mixed lighting that uh, doesn't produce the most pleasing color, you might say. And so in some cases, we're trying to compensate for that. So there are a variety of different approaches you can take. You saw that I used the eyedropper tool. I only use the eyedropper tool to demonstrate why I don't use the eyedropper tool. Because the eyedropper tool here, the white balance tool, is essentially just trying to make an area be perfectly neutral, and that's not always what I want. Now, if you decide that you like using that white balance tool for purposes of setting a baseline, that's perfectly fine, but be sure to come back to the temp and tint sliders, temperature and tint. Those are our color balance controls in the context of most raw processing software. That is based essentially on the lab color model, which separates the A and B channels from a luminance channel, as opposed to RGB, where we don't have a luminance channel, we just have three individual color channels. And so we can shift that balance. We do have the preset, so I can say, well, I'm pretty sure that there was some tungsten lighting in there, or no, I guess not. Maybe it was fluorescent lighting, or perhaps it was daylight balanced perfect light. No, it definitely wasn't that. So I'll just leave this at as shot and then take those sliders. And my feeling is, if I use a preset from the pop-up, or if I use my white balance tool to click on an area of the image, I'm still going to fine tune with temperature and tint. So to me, I might as well start there. If you feel that you don't have a good eye for color, first, make sure that you've calibrated your monitor display, and second, practice. If you swing these sliders <clears throat> through their extremes, you will recognize that this is far too blue, starting to get a little purple, 
and this is far too kind of orangey yellow. Too cold, too warm. And if you continue swinging through those extremes but start to kind of narrow it down into what looks a little more natural, you'll eventually find a place where you're happier with that overall balance of color. Now, of course, this does take some practice in terms of recognizing color, but just the very process of swinging those sliders through their extremes will help you develop an eye for what is working and what is not working. And when you think that you're pretty close, another great trick that you can use in Lightroom, in Adobe Camera Raw, and in other software tools, click into the numeric value for the adjustment, in this case temp, and then you can use the up arrow on the keyboard to increase the value, in this case shifting toward a more yellow value, or the down arrow on the keyboard to shift toward a more blue or cooler color. I can also hold the shift key to take bigger jumps in that adjustment, and then I can just fine tune. So I think right about there looks pretty good to me as far as that temperature adjustment. And then tint. Now for temperature, we've got a little more leeway, a little more artistic interpretation. We could cool things down, warm things up. With tint, not so much. A little goes a long way with tint. And so we don't have to swing through quite the extremes to get a sense of, okay, that's way too green and that's way too magenta. So let's try and find a good value somewhere in between. And then again, once you get pretty close to where you think you have a good value, click into the numeric setting, the numeric value for, in this case, the tint slider, and then that same up and down arrow key or the shift up and down arrow key in order to fine tune. And right about there looks to be good, I would say, to my eye. And so taking that overall temp and tint slider, and again, a lot of this is just practice, developing an eye for how those sliders affect various colors throughout the image, trying to keep in mind that, for example, this eye beam in the background actually was painted with this sort of uh, subtle yellow tone to it. So if I'm trying to compensate for yellow light, that's not a good reference in that case. So trying to get that color as accurate as possible or as pleasing as possible, depending on your own personal preference. And speaking of getting more pleasing color, Saturation, of course, is a common topic among photographers, and when it comes to saturation, what we're really talking about, we would refer to that oftentimes as intensity of color or the strength of that color. It actually relates to the purity of the color. How close is the color to a primary? So red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow. And so those primaries, is it really, really close to a pure red? or is it watered down, so to speak, with a little green and blue, which makes it less saturated? And so when we're talking about saturation, of course, we're all familiar with bad HDR work where the colors start to look just absolutely ridiculous. And so you wanna be very careful with that saturation. It takes a little practice to develop that eye. You know, I often use the analogy of driving down the highway at, oh, 60 or 70 miles an hour then you get off at an exit in a small town and there's a 20 mile an hour speed limit and it feels like you're going two miles an hour because you've gotten kind of acclimated to that speed on the highway. The same thing can happen with saturation. We start to develop this sense of like, oh yeah, that seems to be okay. And then somebody looks over your shoulder and wonders what in the heck is going on. So if I adjust my saturation in general, that can be a little more problematic because saturation is a very even balance in terms of shifting the intensity or the purity of those colors. We're having an equal effect across essentially all of the colors in the image. Whereas the vibrance adjustment, which is available in a wide variety of software tools, it's in Lightroom obviously, Adobe Camera Raw, as well as Photoshop as an adjustment layer. And what vibrance does is takes an uneven approach. It applies a stronger effect to colors that are less saturated and a lesser effect to colors that are more saturated. And what that sort of translates to is it's like putting on the brakes as colors get closer and closer to being completely pure. And so if I increase the value for vibrance, for example, you'll notice that the sky and the Ferris wheel in the background start to increase in saturation while the sign on the, the umbrellas in the foreground, the overall color of the umbrella doesn't seem to be changing at all. So we're having an uneven effect. So now, at this point, having boosted the satur sorry, boosted the vibrance, it is boosting saturation, but the vibrance control specifically, now I've, what you might say, equalized the overall colors in the image. 
Obviously at this point, the colors in the background are a little bit too strong, so I don't want to take that too far, but I can boost the sky and the Ferris wheel by using that vibrance without creating a problem for the umbrella in the foreground. And in many cases, then you'll find that we can boost that vibrance in order to draw out colors that you might not have even necessarily noticed so much. So notice that I'm bringing out those colors in the clouds in the background without making the flower in the foreground appear odd. And then one of my favorite tricks when it comes to using vibrance relates to combining both vibrance and saturation. Very often I find that vibrance is all I need. And so as I increase vibrance, notice once again that the orange, for example, in the mouth of the iguana, well actually it's not an orange, I think it might be a papaya or something, but I'm not totally educated on my tropical fruit, but the saturated colors of orange there are not being adjusted as strongly as those more subtle colors in the iguana as well as the foliage in the background. At some point though you might say, well I've sort of equalized those overall colors but now the image looks too saturated overall. And so very often what I'll do is increase the value for vibrance and then reduce the value for saturation. Because with that vibrance adjustment, I rarely need to increase the value for saturation. Sometimes I do, but more often than not, what I'll find is that I'll apply a strong adjustment for vibrance to help equalize the overall colors in the image, and then I'll reduce the value for saturation. So that is a very helpful trick in many cases with many images. All right, we're gonna change gears here ever so slightly, I suppose you could say, and take a look at some talk about black and white. And I wanna address a few questions from, a ter uh, from some of the uh, attendees here today. Uh, so, a great question. And yeah, just confirming your assumption there, Pete, uh, negative clarity can help erase age lines. Yes, absolutely. I didn't mention that explicitly, but I did mention that negative clarity is great for portraits, and that's exactly why. It helps to soften up the overall features in the, in the face. Um, and then uh, George points out that Android allows DNG capture. Yes, I was just referring to the iPhone because that's what I happen to use, but there are a number of apps on Android phones that support DNG capture as well. Um, and then soft proofing. Why does it say soft proofing? Uh, at the bottom, uh, so he's just asking about this soft proofing checkbox. When I'm in the develop module, Lightroom enables me to simulate the appearance of a specific printed output. So I could choose a printer, ink, and paper combination, essentially a paper profile, if you will, and then I can apply adjustments to compensate for that specific output. So that's the reference here. The soft proofing checkbox is where you enable that feature. Uh, so, really good question. Another one from George. Have you ever, I may have covered it, but is it ever okay to allow clipping such as what is shown in the coins image? And I would say that yes, absolutely, there are situations where clipping is perfectly fine. I gave the specific example of that Seattle skyline where we had some bright lights, but reflections. And so that uh, little statue of the, what is that character? I don't even know what that was. Um, but this character in the subway here in New York City, this guy, whatever, whatever you'd call him, some of these areas are completely blown out. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. I don't need to have details in these specular highlights, these shiny areas. I don't expect to see detail or the, I think that's a fluorescent tube in the background perhaps. I don't expect a light bulb to have texture and detail in it it's when I lose detail in something like white feathers on a bird that it becomes problematic. Uh, so Adam says that, uh, I, he says, I referred to clarity as sharpening, but isn't it really edge contrast enhancement which creates the illusion of sharpening? That's a trick question because the answer is both. Clarity is really edge contrast enhancement which creates the illusion of sharpening, and sharpening is really edge contrast enhancement, which, in, of which creates the illusion of sharpening. They're both uh, producing the same, you might say, mathematical effect. The difference is that clarity is applying that across a larger distance. And so if you want to play with that in Photoshop, even if you're using an ancient version of Photoshop, you still have the unsharp mask filter, which is a sharpening filter. If you use a large value for the radius, somewhere around 20 pixels, and a low value for the amount, maybe somewhere around 25% or so, you will get what is very, very similar to a clarity adjustment.
All right, so let's go ahead and get back to a couple of other images here, and then I'll be happy to address some additional questions. When it comes to black and white, there's a couple of key things that I want to point out. And one of those relates to essentially a workflow consideration. So I think the basic concept here is pretty well understood by most photographers. If I switch to black and white, then I have the ability, and this is executed in a variety of different ways with different software, but I have the ability to fine tune the tonal values based on the original color values. And so if I want to darken up the barn, the barn was red, and so I can reduce the value for red in the black and white mix. Or I could maybe brighten up the yellows a little bit and brighten up the greens, or in this case, maybe even darken up the greens to accentuate the shadows in the wheat field there. But again, the point is that I can lighten or darken various areas of the image. I think that's pretty well understood by most photographers, and certainly that means you'll want to pay careful attention to the various color values and therefore luminance values that you're producing when you're interpreting a color photo as a black and white. But more importantly, and the reason that I wanted to bring up black and white in today's presentation is that I find many photographers, as soon as they convert to black and white, they forget about the basics. They work on these sliders to adjust the luminance values based on different colors within the original image, and they forget all about their adjustments that affect the overall tonality. Or, in their mind, they don't think they need to go back to those adjustments because they already adjusted their overall tonal adjustments before they converted to black and white. But even if you did, you should revisit those adjustments as soon as you convert to black and white. So, for example, I'll back off that white point just a little bit using the clipping preview, maybe fine-tune my blacks level, certainly add a little bit of clarity because I do like the texture here, and I might want to pull down the highlights in order to, for the most part, emphasize a little more of that detail in the moon. It also darkens the sky just a little bit. I could even tone down those shadows just a little bit to emphasize that contrast. But again, revisiting those basic tonal adjustments, even if you already applied those adjustments based on the color image, you might make very different decisions, and the clipping would certainly be different in the context of a black and white, of a monochromatic image. And then finally, I just wanted to address the ability to apply color toning, a tint to the image, or in the context of many software tools these days, a split toning where we can apply a different color to the highlights versus the shadows in the image. And so I'll go ahead and just convert this image to black and white. We'll assume that that mix is good, so I won't worry about fine-tuning the overall color values. Obviously, I could go through and apply some adjustments there, but I want to emphasize the, the toning, the color effect that we can apply. And this will be emphasized or made available in different ways in different software tools. In many cases, you might simply have a tint control where I've converted the image to a monochromatic black and white interpretation, shades of gray. But then I can add a tint so that instead of shades of gray, it is shades of some other color. In the case of Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw, we have the ability to apply split toning. I need to first increase the saturation so I can actually see the colors, and then I can choose a color for the highlights versus the shadows independent of each other. And so let's just make an exaggerated result. I'll make some kind of purplish magenta shadows and some kind of yellowish highlights. And then I can actually shift the balance as well so I can make more of the colors fall into that shadow color or more of the colors fall into that highlight color. And you can create some very interesting results. And oftentimes I find that if you want to apply a color tint to a black and white image, there is more impact by using split toning with two colors as opposed to one, adding a little bit of warmth into the deep dark shadows, kind of a slight magenta tint into those shadows can work very nicely, for example, and in some cases cooling down the highlights just a little bit. The right answer depends on the subject matter and your preference and your taste in an image, etc. But we can also still use a single color if we prefer. Remember, I can shift that balance. Well, if I shift the balance all the way in one direction or the other, in this case, I've gone to plus 100, so that would emphasize the highlights color. Now I have split toning with only a single color. And so I will, once again, slide through the color wheel here and decide which color. Maybe I want kind of a cyanotype 
sort of effect in this case, or more stereotypically would be a sepia tone. I found the color. Remember, I boosted the saturation just so I could see the color. I find the color, and in most cases, then I want a very subtle color. Not always, but my personal approach usually is that I want at first glance for the image to just look like a black and white. And then the more you look at it, the more you get this kind of psychological impact of the color. It feels like a cool scene, or it feels a little warm. Whatever that color influence might be, I do like for that to be a relatively subtle effect. Well, that covers the basics in terms of our adjustments here. I hope all of that's been helpful. I know we have a fair number of questions here, so I'll get to as many of those as I possibly can now. Uh, so let's take a look here. Uh, in the histogram on my camera at RAW, it seems to read different from JPEG. Why? Very good question. And in many respects, a simple answer. In your camera, the RAW image is not receiving the adjustments that the JPEG is receiving. So first off, your camera by default will apply adjustments to a JPEG without your say, essentially. It's giving you a, an interpretation of the image that is not so flat, you might say. And so if you shoot RAW plus JPEG, you'll see a difference between the two in many cases once you've processed them. Usually the preview for the RAW is going to be based on a JPEG version. And so you're getting adjustments. And if you add contrast, saturation, et cetera, at, with the settings that are available in your camera, those types of adjustments will not actually affect the RAW capture. Therefore, the interpretation is different. And as a result, the histogram display can be different. And the histogram is also dependent upon the color space that you've set in the camera in most cases. You can usually choose between sRGB versus Adobe RGB. Uh, so <laughs> that's a great question that I don't think there's a very good answer for. So the question is that when it comes to the color cast, sometimes later on when you're processing your image, it's hard to remember what that scene looked like and the simple fact is that it's hard to trust your eyes even because you have white point adaptation in your human visual system and there's all sorts of challenges inherent in that. Here is what I would actually suggest in many cases as you know, I'm a huge fan of course of capturing RAW. If you also capture a JPEG image, use your smartphone or a point and shoot camera or capture a JPEG with your SLR even, that will very often give you a reasonably accurate rendering of that overall scene that you can use as a basis. But otherwise, a lot of that frankly just comes down to the memory to the extent possible and your own creative interpretation. Uh, so in black and white photo, do you still revisit the basic? Yes, so if you're using something like Silver Effects Pro from Nick, which I absolutely love, would you still revisit your basic adjustments? And I would say yes, in that case, it's more just making sure that you've got good detail and tonal range. It becomes much less important. If you're applying a basic tonal adjustment and a basic black and white conversion, then you definitely want to revisit. If you're using a third-party tool, a plug-in, then that becomes less important because in theory, presumably you've taken a look at those basic issues in terms of contrast and tonality with that software tool. Uh, so Linda asks, she was told that prior to changing the image to a black and white, should I first boost the colors in the original image, increase the saturation? What I would say there is that doing so is going to give you more contrast, which could be beneficial. So it's not a bad idea, keeping in mind that we can always apply those, go back and apply those adjustments after the fact. And so, yes, in many cases, boosting that saturation is going to give you greater color separation which gives you greater flexibility in terms of those overall sliders when you're adjusting the tonality. Can you get to where you want with the cloud and sky photo just by letting Photoshop elements do auto processing? So that was with clarity here, we had these clouds that were a little bit intense and we boosted those. And yes, very often you'll find that with auto tone adjustments, you will get a boost in contrast that will help. Clarity is a little more sophisticated, and so I would say it's not quite the same. But again, if you're using a tool that doesn't have clarity, take a look at your sharpening filters and use a large radius and a low amount, low strength for that sharpening, and that can help significantly.
Uh, great question regarding color space. Do you work in Adobe uh, or sRGB? In the context of Lightroom, we're always working in what is essentially ProPhoto RGB. In Photoshop, I do prefer to work in ProPhoto RGB. The caveat is you must work in 16-bit per channel mode if you're going to work in ProPhoto RGB. Otherwise, there's too great a risk of clipping. And so otherwise, the choice of color space largely depends upon your workflow. I would say that ProPhoto RGB is great if you want the maximum color range possible and you're working in 16-bit per channel mode. Adobe RGB is a good sort of safe bet for most applications. And then sRGB would be primarily for either print workflows that involve an sRGB workflow. And there are many print labs that revolve around an sRGB workflow or if you're just sharing your work online. Ah, do I shoot RAW plus JPEG? No, I do not, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to add the extra space being filled up to my cards when I'm capturing images. And two, especially because I'm using Lightroom to process my images, there's simply no advantage. In essence, you might say that I'm using RAW plus JPEG after the fact. I'm not capturing RAW plus JPEG. I only capture RAW. And then in Lightroom, Lightroom generates a preview that is actually a JPEG image based on my original RAW capture, and I can use that for faster browsing. I can even browse those previews when I don't have my original captures available to me. And yes, just a comment that was posted here mentioned that yes, indeed, as always, all of the webinars in the Gray Learning webinar series are recorded, and since you're registered for this webinar, you will receive a link to that recording so that you can watch it as many times as you'd like, and we certainly encourage watching it as often as you care to, as many times as you possibly can. Uh, so Teresa points out she checks the lens correction boxes first, so she is going through and adjusting the overall profile if she has one and the lens correction. So for example, applying profile-based lens corrections and chromatic aberration removal the lens correction, of course, would be based on the specific lens that you use to capture the image. And is that a good workflow? Yes, absolutely. And I certainly encourage that. I just felt that in the context of this presentation, that was more about the actual basic adjustments. But we will have another webinar in the not too distant future that focuses on those lens and perspective corrections. So do stay tuned for that. And then uh, George points out that he says he doesn't seem to have the eye that I have. I talked about the door being crunchy and urban. You could see changes, but what does that term really mean? And so if we go back to my clarity adjustment from the door here, if we take a look, and in fact I will, let's go into the clarity adjustment here, and I'm going to hide my other panels just so we can make the most of the image size here. And as I increase the value for clarity, notice that you are seeing every little nook and cranny, every bit of chipped paint, every single bit of variation in tonal value in this image is being emphasized. And that can be sometimes a little bit too much. Here I would say, especially if you're going to print this image, you could certainly get away with that but you do want to be careful that things don't start to look just a little over-processed. In a manner of speaking, you can think of it as sort of appearing a little over-sharpened just without the halo effect. All right, a few more questions here that we have. Uh, so yeah, very good question about the preview. So I made reference to the JPEG preview in Lightroom that I'm kind of sort of taking advantage of RAW plus JPEG after the fact in a manner of speaking. But the question is, was the preview in develop? That's your RAW preview, correct? And that is correct. So in the library module, you are seeing a JPEG interpretation of your original RAW capture. It does get updated based on your adjustments. Within the develop module, you're seeing the actual result of processing the raw capture or whatever the source file may be, plus all of the adjustments that you've applied. And what that translates to is that the develop module is your best place to get an accurate view of what your image looks like. Think of the library module as just an area to get organized and find the photos you want to work with. When you really want to critically evaluate the images, you'll want to be sure to do that in the develop module. Uh, so Laura says she knows I can't endorse a specific camera, a uh, fair point, 
but asks what I'm using as my go-to digital SLR. I happen to shoot Canon, and so right now my preference, my camera of choice is the Mark uh, 7D Mark II. There are certainly some compromises there. Part of this relates originally to video support and some other issues. Um, part of it is just that I don't need a bigger, heavier camera. And so she also had as part of her question here, the notion of using a mirrorless camera. And I assure you that that is something I think about on every single photo trip. Uh, as soon as my lower back starts to ache from my very heavy backpack, and so it is something we consider, especially for video production work. But so far, I'm still an SLR shooter, and certainly mirrorless cameras are getting better and better. And when it comes to image quality, I would say many of them are on par. Obviously, you need to compare the individual features of you know, each individual camera and quality, etc. But uh, certainly mirrorless cameras have come a long way and are producing some excellent, excellent results. Uh, so I'm seeing, some educators say expose to the left and not the right. Why would they say that? Well, I would suggest that they're saying that because old habits die hard and they did that in the old film days to help maintain density in the transparencies and that that is an outdated notion in the context of digital. And in fact, I would say that exposing to the left with a digital capture is quite simply a bad idea. More often than not, I try to be fair and acknowledge that there are more than one right answer to all sorts of different challenges. In fact, many photographers shoot JPEG and produce excellent, excellent results, and I have no problem with that. But I would say exposing to the left is quite simply a bad idea in terms of exposure. And then a great question related to ISO. What's the highest ISO to use uh, without diminishing resolution too much? So you saw my example images for that exposed to the right demonstration and how much noise I was getting, and in that case, at 16,000 ISO. The answer is, I don't know. More specifically, the answer depends on your specific camera. Each camera is going to produce different results in terms of noise. The smaller the sensor, the greater the risk of noise. The higher the resolution relative to a given sensor size, the greater the risk of noise. Capture conditions also, the use of amplification, the specific type and quality of amplification, there are so many specific details that affect noise that I would say simply marking an ISO is the max. If you hear someone say you should never shoot above 800 or 1600 ISO, think of that as a very general rule of thumb based on whatever camera that person happens to use. Each camera is going to produce different results. Some cameras are not good at all when it comes to noise. Some are exceptionally great but it will vary and it will vary based on the conditions. In long exposures, you're always going to have more noise than a short exposure, for example. And so my recommendation, strong recommendation, is to get familiar. First off, obviously you probably want to make a decision about which camera to buy based on the performance. Check reviews, if you can get your hands on that camera and test it out, great. But once you have a camera that you're using for your photography, then I would say that it is absolutely critical to get familiar with the noise behavior. Get out there and capture a series of tests at different ISO settings, long exposures, normal exposures, etc., and get a feel for at what ISO setting does it become too much for your tastes. For me personally, as I mentioned, I'm shooting the Canon 7D Mark II. I love the camera. It's not the best when it comes to noise, and so I try to limit myself ideally to no more than 800 ISO, 1600 ISO to me feels like pushing my luck a little bit, but having said all that, if the difference between getting the shot and not getting the shot is higher ISO, I will not hesitate for a second to raise the ISO. If I need a faster shutter speed and I've already opened up the aperture to full open or whatever it is, there are situations where you just need more ISO and I say, whatever it takes to get the job done, that is the ISO setting that you should use. Because ultimately, what it boils down to is that we want to make sure that we're getting the photo. If we have to make some compromises, that's under, understandable, but understand the behavior of your camera so that you know what to expect. All right, so that's all the time we have for today. If I missed your question, I do apologize, and feel free to send that as a follow-up email, and I'll do my best to answer as many of those as possible. But I hope that you found the details that were covered today helpful. As I mentioned, the webinar series is presented by Gray Learning and sponsored by Tamron, so I want to spend, send a special thanks out to Tamron for supporting this webinar. 
Notice I didn't mention a single Tamron lens. We were just talking about optimizing. The aim was just to help educate you on approaching some of those adjustment basics so that you feel more confident in your ability to produce better results. But Tamron is very generous to support this webinar series, and so I certainly want to thank them. And thank you for joining me, and do stay tuned for future presentations in the Gray Learning webinar series, and we'll hope to see you on a future presentation. Thanks very much.